Hello, everyone. I'm Tom Coffey, president of the Louisville Forum. Welcome to our October 2024 program. The Louisville Forum programs typically meet at noon on the second Wednesday of each month here at Vincenzo's Restaurant downtown. All are welcome. Founded in 1984, 40 years ago, the Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group. We host debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. For more information on the Louisville Forum, our events, to join, or to make a reservation, please visit louisvilleforum.org. Today's program. There are very few people, if there's in fact anyone, whom our members would rather hear from than the chief of our police department. Crime and public safety in Jefferson County, particular downtown, has come up at every program we have had this year. Affordable housing, downtown revitalization, Amendment 2, entrepreneurs, TARC, it is the constant issue that we hear about. Whether Jefferson County is becoming more or less safe, perception, reality, it makes no difference. It just keeps coming up. It was October 2023, last year's program exactly one year ago, that Mayor Greenberg and LMPD's former chief spoke at our monthly event. Regrettably, it did not take long before LMPD needed a new chief appointed. On Monday, September 16th, Mayor Greenberg announced that Paul Humphrey would be the new Louisville Metro Police Department chief, removing the interim tag he had had since June. I'm going to read Chief Humphrey's biography that the mayor's office posted, but before that, many of you probably read last February in the New York Times the piece on the Louisville Police Department. Chief Humphrey was a central person, if not the main character in the piece. If you have not read it, I humbly encourage you to do so because as written, without any inclination, Chief Humphrey would be sitting here today as the chief, or at least not this, not this quickly. Paul Humphrey is a lifelong Louisville resident whose family members worked in public service. Chief Humphrey joined, chief Humphrey joined LMPD as a patrol officer in 2006, following his graduation from the University of Louisville. The biogra biography didn't mention this, but it's included on uh, Chief Humphrey's resume, which was, which was posted on the, uh, the mayor posted on the webpage. His undergraduate degree is in psychology with a minor in philosophy, and that he is currently working towards his master's in criminal justice. Since 2006, Chief Humphrey has served as a patrol officer and a patrol supervisor in the 1st, 2nd, 4th, and 6th Divisions. A longtime member of the LMPD SWAT team, Chief Humphrey was promoted to SWAT team commander in 2017. Chief Humphrey is credited with restructuring the SWAT team, creating a new culture of improvement and accountability while managing the team's training, tactical planning, and operating budget. In 2019, Chief Humphrey was chosen to lead the LMPD training division before being promoted to deputy chief for accountability and improvement in 2022, where he led LMPD's police reform initiatives during and after the DOG's pattern and practice investigation of the department. Welcome, Chief Humphrey. Well. <clears throat> Thank you all for having me here. I, I appreciate the invite. Uh, hopefully I'm the same chief that comes back next October. Uh, but uh, so all resumes aside, uh, I think what we have to focus on that we haven't focused on is how do we keep people safe and do that the right way? And how do we do that collaboratively with uh, the community at the same time? Uh, and so these type of forums, I think, and I was, I was telling him earlier, I, I, I really like this environment because it gives me the opportunity to talk about the profession that I love and the job that I care about deeply. And I think as a profession, we don't do a very good job generally of telling people what we do or why we do it. And, and I think a lot of the problems that we have as a profession, we could solve just through communication. Um, and so that's what I want to be able to give you today is some insights into what we are doing and why we're doing it. Uh, but I also believe as part of that, if you're going to accomplish something, you have to have a plan to do it. Um, and so one of the first things that we've worked on is having a strategic plan for violent crime, uh, which we just uh, went over with all of the city uh, departments just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And so we tasked several of the city departments that are going to be part of that with making sure that they pull their weight and they hold us accountable to doing our jobs as well. Uh, we also recognize that downtown has to be a priority. 
uh, crime in downtown uh, should not be something that deters people from coming. Uh, we talk about ourselves as a city of neighborhoods, and everybody's proud of where they grew up, um, and uh, everybody's proud of the neighborhood they live in now, but downtown is the city's neighborhood. It's everybody's neighborhood, and it's the economic driver not just uh, for the city, but it's the economic driver for the entire state. So if we don't have a, a vibrant downtown, then it damages and it harms the entire state. And so part of that also is how we communicate to officers the value of making sure that downtown is safe and making sure that people uh, understand uh, the resources and the time and that we're putting into making sure that downtown is safe. So uh, that's all part of the crime strategy and we're going to uh, grow that crime strategy as uh, time progresses. So I will not filibuster, but I do like to talk so I will wait and answer questions as he gives them to me. And uh, I, I do want to tell uh, our questionnaires and everyone here in the audience today, uh, something has come up that uh, uh, Chief Humphrey may have to leave a little bit early today. Um, one thing though, so if, if you guys can write some questions down and, and give them as quick as you can. Mike Ward is one of our board members collecting questions. I did have one question for you, Chief, before we get started. In the, in the article in the New York Times, this is a quote that you gave that I found just captivating. This is, this, is a, this is a quote that you gave to the reporter, and you, and you said in quotes, you hear these stories about cops who do heroic things, and they say, I didn't sign up to be a hero, Humphrey told me, not me, the reporter. No, I'm sorry, I signed up to be a hero. The vast majority of cops signed up to be somebody's hero. Is that the department you want? 100%. And the reason why cops, and you hear people say that stuff, is they didn't ask for attention for it. Uh, so, but I, I encourage them, don't shy away from being a hero. Don't do stupid stuff to get awards. But like we have volunteered to do things that other people don't. We are taking care of the community in a different way. And it, it, you should never be ashamed of this job. And so you should not hide from the fact that you do things that others are not willing to do. You put yourself at risk. You go into danger where others don't. So there are plenty of service professions out there, right? Um, some might claim that lawyers are, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about it. <laughs> but there are plenty of service <laughs> professions out there, right? Um, you, can, you can be clergy. You can be a nurse. You can... You can be a teacher, a counselor, a therapist. We get to be all of those things, but we also have the unique authority of enforcing the law. And so that is what separates us. So I don't want officers to shy away from that. Um, I don't want officers to feel like they should be ashamed of their, their skill set. Uh, an emergency room doctor gets excited when there's a bad car accident. It's not, it doesn't mean that they're happy that somebody got hurt. What it means is that they're really excited that they get the opportunity to put all of the skills and all of their learning to the test in order to help somebody else. It's the same way for us. I get really excited when I get the opportunity to help somebody else in my particular branch of service, and I think officers should be proud of that. Thank you, Chief. Nicole and Mike, whenever you're ready. So the first question here is, what is the role of the FOP in the new police department? And new to poli police department is in quotes. Uh, the role of the FOP is to represent the union interest of the officers in the most political answer I could give. Um, no, um, I go back and forth with the FOP on all kinds of stuff. Uh, we don't see eye to eye on certain things, on other things we do. So where I can use them as a, as a, as a tool, as a sounding board, uh, I do. And where we have to fight and argue about things, we do. So um, understand this, the FOP, just like any other entity, does not run the police department. We run the police department. All right, keep going. All right. Are there any tools our legislature could provide to you to help fight crime um, and gangs in Louisville? And so keep in mind, I'm reading um, others' handwriting. But I want to add to that because it looks like another one here that says, what steps will you take to reduce crime while ensuring fairness and equity in law enforcement? So let's kind of go together. 
Those are two big answers that we could spend like hours on separately. All right. Keep um, so as far as uh, from the state legislature standpoint, I would say there are, there are a few things. Is one, make crime illegal, and then people will stop doing it. That's a joke. Um, no, so, <clears throat> but from a serious standpoint, I know there's been some talk about uh, the ability for us to conduct wiretaps and investigations. Uh, we currently cannot at the state level. We have to go through the feds in order to do that, which those are kind of the last, the last ditch effort uh, investigative tool for uh, investigators on very, very important cases. Um, I would say, in all honesty, the biggest problem that we have in law enforcement is staffing. Uh, not just here, but uh, in the profession in general. But one of the factors that is huge is the changing of the pension system. When we went away from having a defined pension into a 401k, what it meant is that officers can get up and walk away and take that with them. It, we have to recognize that the generation that we all grew up in, with the exception of a, a couple of young people over there, where you have brand loyalty, you have fealty to a, a job, an employer, a profession, does not exist anymore. And so we have to have tools in order to keep people here. Part of that is pay. I think we're getting paid pretty well. A lot of that is leadership. I think we're on the right path with our leadership and making sure that people who work for LMPD know that their leadership cares about them and has invested in them. But part of that is also security. This job is one that you walk with insecurity every single day. It is one of the things that people of my generation saw as being one of the biggest benefits of this job is that I was gonna have a pension when I walk away from this, from this place. So if we're dealing with a job market where young people, they, they don't expect to work for the same place for 20, 25, 30 years, they get up and walk away regularly, we have to do some other things that help pull them in and help keep them here. And so I would say, getting back to a defined benefit pension system would be absolutely enormous for us. Chief, what are your plans for keeping the youth in school away from violent crimes? So that's a multi-focused uh, approach that has to happen. One, I can't raise your kids. Uh, if the police have to raise your kids, then we're going to continue to house your kids for the rest of their lives and it, they'll be behind bars on those houses and those windows, right? So we can't raise your kids for you. So there's a, there's a community aspect that, that comes with that. Of You have to know where your kids are and what your kids are into. Um, but the other thing is how do we outreach to youth? And we are not a resource, right? But what we are is we are a liaison to resources. And so the programs that we have, like our PAL program in order to uh, get kids off the street and start to interact with with officers and and do productive things uh, Those things are are very important Then we have things like our GVI program our group violence intervention And there's a whole arm of group violence intervention and if you don't know what that is what it is is identifying uh, participants or people who are family uh, friends associated with violent people and identifying those people and offering them resources in order to change their lifestyle. And so we want to have people get out of the violent lifestyle. And so in collaboration with many non-governmental non organizations like Goodwill, uh, resources are offered, job training, uh, education, those types of things, counseling services to get people out of that lifestyle. Um, and there's an entire arm of that that is dedicated to juveniles who are obviously in very, very high risk situations. They've been identified as being either the next criminal or the next victim. And we often are able to spot those, those kids. And I'll tell you just from personal experience, you, it's, it's sad. Because you walk into these houses and you see these kids that are six, seven, eight, ten years old, and you just want to hug them. But then at a certain time in their life, the script flips and you and you knew it was going to happen and now they're 15 and you're chasing them with a gun and we have to get to them before they get to that age um, and so there has to be more uh, community involvement in dealing with juveniles because the police are not going to solve the juvenile problem because once they're old enough for us to deal with them they are really beyond our capabilities of pulling back
Uh, Chief, the question here is a little longer, but the bottom line is, how do you change a culture that has allowed the Explorers program scandal, the slushies being thrown on civilians, and things that we hear about and read about that are like that? Um, so it's simple, not easy, right? Uh, I think Maya Angelou said, don't tell me what they said about me behind my back. Tell me why they felt comfortable doing it in front of you or saying it in front of you. It's the same way with behavior. If someone does something in front of you that is questionable, don't question them. Question why they felt okay with doing it in front of you. And so we're always quick to point fingers at each other when really we should be looking at ourselves for a lot of this stuff. Why would somebody think it's okay to do something in front of me or around me? So if I don't create the environment where people feel comfortable doing those types of things around me, it means they either don't do it anymore or they take themselves elsewhere. But there also has to be a legitimate system that reinforces and encourages people to, to take care of each other. Uh, accountability, we've got to change the whole paradigm around the conversation of accountability. Accountability is not a bad thing Accountability does not equal discipline. Discipline is part of accountability at times, but accountability is actually how you show people you care about them. It's setting a standard and then making sure that people are upheld to that standard. And that standard might be that, hey, you did a really, really good job, but you can do better. You have more potential than that. And when you create that standard of accountability where there's this constant feedback loop, there are structured systems for accountability. What it does is it encourages those everyday conversations on performance and behavior, and it becomes part of the culture, and people get very, very accustomed to talking to each other about behavior and performance, which means that when it's time to have that really difficult conversation with somebody, then it's much more easy to have because we haven't waited for, for a problem to become a real issue at that point, we've, inter we've interjected ourselves into their behavior before it ever really becomes a problem. Um, if you are not giving me feedback on a regular basis, what you're telling me is you don't care about me. Because either you think I can't do any better, so I'm an idiot, or I have bad work ethic, or you just don't care if I fail. So it has to be part of the normal everyday culture for us to call each other out. Uh, that, you know, I kind of got that from being on SWAT is that we were very, very hard on each other, right? And I'm talking about, these are not the system things. These are the people things. This is how you treat people. We were very hard on each other. We would, go to, we would go to ops operations and we would get finished with it and everybody would pat us on the back and say, hey, great job, nobody got hurt. And we would go back to the office and absolutely destroy each other and pick each other apart and say, we could have done better just because nobody else noticed that we didn't live up to our potential. We all know it. And so how do we make sure that our successes are reinforced and they're intentional and our failures are both recognized and addressed for improvement? So it, there are formal systems that have to be put in place, but changing culture is about how you deal with people and the expectations you set for them. All right, we're having to move up to the microphone because we've been told we're standing in the way when we stand here. Um, so I'm going to ask you two questions, all right? One is we learned this morning that the young man who was shot at the football game died um, either last night or early this morning. He died. And so how can the community stop tragic events such as that? And then the other thing um, is so we know that's a challenge. And what would you say is your biggest internal and external challenges? Again, you love the multiple questions that are like, <laughs> that we could, write, we, could write, we could write books on. So I don't think I answered your second question the first time. I talked right past it, and now I don't even remember what it was. Um, so how do, we, how do we stop what happened at that football game that day, right? You all know when something's wrong. Plain and simple. A group of seven or eight kids standing around outside of a football game that they weren't, were denied access to, I probably shouldn't say too much because there's certain investigative things I can't talk about, but that's freaking suspicious. Call the police. Like, seriously, 
we have to be at the point where we recognize things are wrong and we call the police. And then the, we have to get there and do our job and feel empowered to do our job. So internally, part of the biggest problem that we have is a fear of doing our job, right? Whether it's caused by leadership or whether it's caused by external factors, officers need to know that they are comfortable in doing their job. The way you do that is you give them a mission, you give them the parameters by which to do it within, and then you train them and resource them so that they can do it comfortably. And then you make sure that they have proper supervision to give them feedback so that when they are going a little bit outside the lines, they come back in, inside of them. But the only way to get officers out there doing proactive police work at the rates that we need is to make sure that they are comfortable doing police work. Are we going to mess up sometimes? 100%. I'm okay with messing up. What I'm not okay with is the status quo, right? And so a big part of combating crime is proactive police work. You can look over the years at both traffic fatalities and homicides and the number of citations that we write for speeding and reckless driving and the number of people that we lock up have a direct inverse correlation. When we write more speeding tickets and reckless driving tickets, traffic deaths go down. When we lock more people up, homicides and shootings go down. We have to be out there doing police work. There are other aspects of solving crime and preventing crime, but as police, our number one tool, number one tool is contact. Contact with people, preferably prior to them committing the crime. I do not want to be successful in a homicide investigation if I can find that person with that gun before that homicide ever happens and lock them up from, for that, or at least break up that, that crime triangle between the victim, the suspect, and the opportunity so that that opportunity goes away for that moment and maybe that crime never happens, right? And so we have, that is one of the biggest challenges we have is I have to get officers comfortable out there doing their job and knowing that they are supported by their, their command staff, their city, and their community in doing that. Was there like a fourth part of that question that I didn't answer? <laughs> are your internal, biggest internal and external challenges? Oh, so communication. Um, so we, I just talked about getting officers out there comfortable in doing their job. Well, the only way to get them comfortable with that is communication. The only way for you, the community, to be comfortable with us doing our job the way that we need to do it is to communicate with you about what we are doing and why we are doing it. Communication is like 90% of leadership failure. It's the ability, the ability and the willingness to explain to people what's going on. And that's not, you know, we talk about transparency. Transparency is one of those uh, you know, $10 words that gets thrown around all the time that nobody actually has a definition of, right? It's like, we can talk about de-escalation. You can't, no, nobody in here can settle on a definition of de-escalation, transparency, leadership, professionalism. There are these words that we throw around all the time, but we really don't put into context, right? Transparency is information with context. I can give you all of the data that you want, right? Previously, we used to release our body camera on officer involved shootings within 24 hours. We had every traffic stop on an Excel spreadsheet listed out for you, and we called that transparency. You have no clue what any of that means. If I show you a video without context, it doesn't matter that I showed it to you within 24 hours, you still don't know what happened. If I give you a Excel spreadsheet with every traffic stop that we ever made, it doesn't tell you anything about who we're stopping, why we're stopping them, how we're treating them. So transparency, both internally and externally, is about context. And that's the biggest job that we have is communication about what we're doing and why. We've gone through a bunch of chiefs. Why are you the right fit? Because <laughs> I got the phone call and said yes. Um, well, here's the thing about, about FIT is that, you know, I guess, we, I guess I can get through a door in many ways, right? Like, we've got to get people inside the, inside the tent. And having been here for my entire career, I... Like there's, oh, there's several faces in here that I recognize that have nothing to do with my profession. But several of you I can call on, I can talk to, or you know me in some context. 
And it's the same way for the professional context, and it's the same way for uh, the people that I work with. Um, I think it gives me a unique perspective to be the only chief that has come from within the department um, that we've had since merger. Uh, if something happens in a neighborhood, like I don't need to pull it up on a map. I know where it is. It, I know people who live there. There's not a part of this community that I can't go to and not run into somebody that uh, knows me from way back when or, or, or from something. And so that, that helps. But I'll tell you one of the biggest ways that it helps is it helps in those tough conversations that you have to have with people. Because there's already a relationship built. Um, I think when, when you tell somebody something and they know that you actually care about them, they're more willing to accept that, even if it's a negative thing. And so the difficulty about leadership, I think, is that um, we don't want to be hypocrites. Right. And on one hand, when we see somebody who works for us that fails, we think it's our failure. And so we have this tendency to want to build a cocoon around it and hide it until we can fix it. Um, but we also don't want to call people out for stuff that we did. And I think that's particularly in police work. I think it's one of the biggest uh, problems with uh, leadership is willing to admit that we're wrong. And so for me, I, I've been wrong my whole life, so it doesn't change anything now that I'm a chief. Like, I'm going to be wrong again, and I really don't care as long as I can identify that and put in the work to fix it, right? There are certain wrongs that I don't want to cross, um, but there are things that I did in policing 15 or 18 years ago that was perfectly acceptable in the, by community standards, by legal standards, by policy standards, by leadership standards, that is not acceptable now. It doesn't mean that I'm a hypocrite to hold somebody accountable to the new standard, right? It means that I'm looking out for their career. And, it's, it, and we, have to, we have to be very comfortable with that. I don't know if that even answers your question, but that's kind of, I mean, I love this place. So I hope that makes me right for this job. All right, we're going to bring you back to some hard questions so you don't get all sentimental on us. Um, <laughs> the chief um, knows me. He's probably going to pull me over when I leave here. How do you keep morale up when the police department is blamed for the crime rate and behaviors that are the choices of others? Yeah, be, that's a loaded question, considering our history. See, I know not to, certain things not to step in, having been here for a while. Um, the thing is, is like the crime rate does get get you down. It it weighs on you. Like these officers, when when we talk about crime rate, I don't know how many of y'all have ever been on a murder scene. Like to you, it's a news story. It, it might be a tick mark on a page on a spreadsheet of saying we have this many homicides or this many shootings. Those officers are the ones that are going out there and watching those kids take their last breath. Like this is personal for us. And so my job in keeping their morale up is supporting them, is giving them the resources, giving them the training, giving them the feedback, giving them the support to know that like, I get it. I get it. People are, are saying you're failing them for things that other people are doing. Okay, that's fine. Let's change the focus. What are we doing and what can we do better? Shut out the noise, right? We want to blame judges for people getting out of, out of jail too early. That's easy to do, right? I can point fingers at judges all day about uh, a guy that we just locked up you know, with, with the ski mask and lurking outside of a store with a gun and he gets released on his own recognizance. It's very easy for me to point my finger at that judge. It's a lot harder for me to look at it and say, okay, what could we have done in our investigation and our paperwork and the way that we did our job so that that doesn't happen in the future, right? So be self-critical and be okay with being self-critical about it, right? And when you become very comfortable with self-criticism, the external criticism you can shake off because you're, it, 
like I said, I've been wrong before. I can be wrong again. Um, but we have to support officers going out there and doing police work and doing it well and making sure that we give them the resources to do it. You've got good media coverage here. You've got the community watching. Please tell the community if there's anything we can do to help you recruit more police officers and what can the city do to help you recruit more police officers. So recruiting more police officers. One, this is a, a great, it is a great job. You get to do things that nobody else gets to do, right? Um, and I get to play adult hide and seek. Like that's pretty neat, right? You all thought that your hide and seek days were over, mine aren't. Um, <laughs> right? Um, but the, that hide and seek game has serious consequences too. The biggest recruiter in any profession, but particularly the data shows the biggest recruiter of police are other police. So the number one way to recruit and get new police officers here is to make sure that the officers that are already here are taken care of and make sure that they are proud and happy about the place that they work, knowing that every day might not be the best. There are going to be good days, there are going to be bad days. But ultimately, you have pride and you have satisfaction in your profession and the place you work and the people you work around. Part of that's about changing a culture about how we treat each other internally. But part of that is also, how does the community talk about us? How do we interact with the community? What's the community expectations? Because a lot of times, com the community talks bad about us or um, is disappointed in us because we haven't properly laid out expectations and settled on what the expectations of this job are for the community. Do you want us to lock people up or do you want us to prevent crime? Because those are two drastically different things, right? Um, and so I know this is, uh, this is supposed to be a recruiting question, but that's what this is about. Recruiting is about culture and it's about the environment that people work in. And so it's my job, it's leadership's job to communicate with you about what we're doing so that you are more understanding and more likely to be receptive in your conversations and your interactions with police officers. That being said, it also makes you more likely to identify people that have the potential for doing this job. Um, there are tons of people on the police department, there are tons of people within the police department who are in positions that they never would have been in had someone else not identified them. I can tell you I never would have been on the SWAT team. I wouldn't be on, I wouldn't be the chief of police. I wouldn't have done a lot of things had other people not believed in me, right? And so that's part of it is how you, the community, identify the people around you and say, you know what? You have a great work ethic. You have good character. You have high, high drive. Have you thought about being a police officer? LMPDjobs.com, <laughs> right? Um, and as much as I complained about the pension system earlier and I would like to see it changed, it is, a, it is a job where you can make a very comfortable living. Um, and we are compensated pretty well now. And so advertise this as a profession to the people around you. And not just as a job, but as a profession. Uh, because that's what it is. It's a calling. All right. You significantly changed LMPD's leadership, including division commanders. That signaled something. What, question mark. Please talk about the new leadership under you. Uh, it's, it's signaled that we had vacancies in our command staff. No, uh, that was a joke too. Um, sometimes you have to, the biggest part of leadership is, is well, I keep, I've said the biggest part of leadership like eight times I think already. It means leader You're a philosophy to, minor. What are you going to do? Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> um, so, um, but a, a big part of leadership is not just having the right team, but it's having the, those team members in the right places. And so moving people around sometimes is a reset for them and their careers. And it, it, it takes people that uh, might have hit a little bit of a lull and it, and it re-energizes them uh, while at the... Uh, at the other place, it takes people and puts them where their skill sets are valuable. The problem with promoting within an industry, and many of you know, is you often, you often promote yourself out of your skill set. Uh, so you've gotten so good at the job that you do that you've been handpicked to lead, do leadership within that profession, and you might not know or be very good at that. 
And so we have to make sure that we embrace leadership development, leadership training, and still identify people and say, you know what, I know you're a, a command level leader, but you are not fit for this particular job. Let's move you over here. Or you've gotten a little stagnant here. You're really, really good at this. Um, some of it's about moving success around too, right? So you're really good at this. I need you to take what you've learned there and bring it to this part of the department as well. So I think, I think move, movement is healthy and movement is opportunity. And so I, I want to set that straight that um, all of the movement within the department isn't, it's not always a bad thing that we move a lot of people around. Um, it's opportunity to reset what we're doing. Would you enact, <clears throat> you're taking a drink made me dry. Would you enact any new gun laws? What could we do with gun laws to help fight crime from a police perspective? And I'll tell you this. Um, obviously, that's a politically touchy conversation, but I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, the availability and the ease of access to, I won't say high capacity, I'll say high quality guns, is a problem. Um, I know they, uh, there's, you know, there's legislation to deal with things like Glock switches, which you can make on a 3D printer to turn a semi-automatic pistol into a fully automatic pistol. Um, but when I was riding the beat, if we got a kel which is like a really crappy gun uh, that was wrapped in duct tape, we got excited about it. And it is nothing for us to see $1,000 guns out on the street on young people. Like it is just the ease of access and then the lack of consequences on the backside when we catch people. Um, what, is, what is the fear of being caught with a gun if there's no consequence to it? Right? Um, it's the law of social consequences, right? You, you all stop for the police officer when they turn their lights on because you've been speeding, right? And you'll pull over and you'll take the ticket. Well, the social consequence of speeding for you wasn't enough to stop you from speeding in the first place, <laughs> right? You're, you're, you're not going to get fired. Your friend group is not going to shame you. And so you were willing to do that. And you weren't so scared of the consequences of getting in a serious accident. So now you have to have an actual consequence, which is the fine. But for you, fine still doesn't even do it, right? Because you're still willing to risk it and you take the fine. However, you stop for that police officer because the social consequences of not stopping for you are too much because your friend group would shun you, your job might fire you because now you've got a felony and you've put all these types of people at risk and those types of things, right? Well, social consequences are different for different people, right? And so, one, we have to do a good job of creating good lives as a society so that social consequences actually have an effect on behavior on more people. But when social consequences don't work, there have to be real consequences. And those real consequences have to be taking people out of society who can't abide by the rules and putting them in adult timeout until they get to the age where they no longer have the drive to be socially uh, divisive and damaging, right? So there has to be real consequences to particularly gun crimes. I am all about making sure that people who have substance abuse issues are not crowding and filling our jails, but people who commit gun crimes need to, plain and simple. And Nicole, it's, a, it's, a little, it's 1240 now, so. Uh, uh, I, can take a, I can take a couple more. Okay, okay. sure. We'll just tell the okay. DOJ I've, to. I've been warned by Mike, I just need to ask one question, so I'm doing so. How do you anticipate the coming consent decree will affect the way officers will do their jobs? Well, okay. That's the, one of the meetings I'm going to after this is to talk about that. Um, here's, the, here's the big thing about consent decree is that, uh, in all honesty, I think all of the police reform that, uh, that we need can be done internally without the DOJ. However, I do recognize that uh, this process is important, and I do recognize that, that people change over time. And so the momentum for improvement and change uh, varies with different people in different offices. So I recognize that's part of what a consent decree does is it makes sure that you keep those goals 
over time and over changing of administrations. Uh, that being said, I think the, the two biggest detriments of a consent decree uh, on the actual officer is the administrative burden that it puts on, puts on officers. Uh, we have the authority to suspend somebody's constitutional rights. That's a huge authority, and we should document and make sure that we do that the right way. However, what we can't do is make sure that an officer in an eight-hour shift is doing four hours of paperwork. That's not going to cut it. That's not going to keep people safe, right? The administrator, uh, anybody who's ever submitted anything to the federal government knows that it's a bureaucratic process. That bureaucracy should never enter a police car. It just shouldn't. Um, but the second part is, is that we, all, we also can't have officers so scared to make a mistake that they don't do any police work. And those two things have historically been the most damaging parts of consent decrees. Take away the, the money that it costs cities and all the unknowns of that type of stuff. I'm talking about the officer on the street should not be overly burdened with administrative tasks and they cannot be scared to do their jobs. Uh, there is pride in being a native Louisvillian, and we hear that in your voice. What are the lessons you learned at St. X that have helped care that you've carried with you? Proud St. X, ma'am. Um, well, uh, one of the things one of the brothers used to say about the, the kids at St. X is that uh, you're teaching the boy to be the man they're going to be, and I would I will tell you that. The best lesson that I learned at St. X is not to quit. Um, it, you know, we can take all of the charisms of the Zavarian brothers, you know, zeal and all of this type of stuff. It's not to quit. My time at St. X was not necessarily the best time. I struggled at St. X. Spent a decent part, portion of my time at St. X hating the school, but I never quit. And that is the thing that I probably learned the most and has probably gotten me through a lot of stuff because there have been, we all run into moments in life where we just want to quit. And you can call it courage or stupidity, probably stupidity more than courage for me in many aspects, but I'm not sure there's ever been anything that I've quit. Keep going. All right, we have one more. We'll go one or two more. Okay. What are the most important changes that need to occur outside of LMPD to make Louisville safer? You say the most important changes that are... What are the most important changes that need to occur outside of LMPD to make Louisville safer? Um, I, I guess kind of... What could go what a little could bit outside yeah, the department? Kind of, kind of go a little bit more existential on this answer, but like we have become as a community far too comfortable with the level of violence in this community. We get, we get up in arms and don't. I'm not trying to belittle any any particular issues. We get up in arms about street racing and car break-ins, and we consistently, consistently over the last four years have looked at 140, 150, 160 homicides. Do y'all know our record number of homicides prior to 2020 was 117? Ever, in history, 117. We haven't been below 140 since. Like, that can't be the new normal as a community. That can't be. If, if we got down to 130 homicides, people would pat me on the back right now, and that's that's not okay. I was about to say some bad words. That's not okay. Like, we should be back down to 55 or 60 homicides where we know we, we can be. Um, the level and comfort with violence that we've gotten in this community is not okay. On a lighter note, tell us about the Wellness Center and how it helps LMPD officers. That is a great one to end on. Um, so as we went through this new version of reform, um, which I think is another one of those words we throw around but don't really define because police reform has happened forever. This profession has never stayed the same. Sometimes we're ahead of the, the curve of society and sometimes we find ourselves on the receiving end of it. Um, but I wanted to make sure that 
officers actually felt like their department and their city cared about them. Uh, coming off of years where officers did not feel that way. That is one of the advantages of being an internal chief is I know what it felt like to work here and you didn't always feel like uh, your department or your city cared about them, about you. And so I wanted to make sure that something that was visible, tangible, usable, and beneficial to officers was front loaded as part of that reform process. So that they know that we are trying to benefit them both professionally and individually as people, and that they were going to be supportive in doing their jobs well. Um, we volunteer to insert ourselves in people's bad lives. That has consequences that come along with it. And we need to make sure that we are putting our time and resources into addressing those consequences. I think, and don't quote me on the stats because I'm not good with numbers all the time unless they're in front of me, but uh, I think the average American ex is exposed to two to three, two to four traumatic events in the course of their lives. The average police officer is like 400, right? Can't just ignore that. Um, I think most of you, if I had run into you at nine o'clock this morning and you hadn't had your cup of coffee yet, you'd probably be a little snarky with me, right? How we feel impacts how we treat other people. And if we want officers to have good community interactions with people, they have to feel physically, mentally, spiritually okay, or else you're gonna get a bad product. And so the Wellness Center and, and all of those initiatives built around uh, officer and employee wellness is about how do we take care of the people who take care of people? Because ultimately as leadership, that's our job. So, sorry, I've got to run. <laughs> It's not awkward at all. <laughs> thank you all. Again, thank you very much, Chief Humphrey. Uh, everyone, uh, next month, please don't join us. November is typically when we have uh, a forum addressing the most recent election fallout. So, uh, should be, should be, uh, should be exciting. So please, everyone, thank you again for being here today. We'll see you. We'll see you.